Good evening. I'm Nisa Petrilli. I'm Jay Kaplan. I'm Steve Ferguson. And I'm Sean Roman. And this is the On the Sports Lines Super Bowl 50 special. anniversary of anything is a big deal mm. and the Super Bowl is no exception. The NFL is pulling out all the stops and so are we. We'll give you three players on each team who must be factors if their team is to win. We'll discuss Peyton Manning's legacy and give you our usual predictions. All that plus a trip down Super Bowl memory lane and a look at three teams involved in the NFL's love triangle with the City of Angels. As always, we want to hear from you. So email us at fanspeak at onthesportslines.com, send your tweets to at onthesportslines, and your posts to facebook.com slash onthesportslines. Well, we spent most of the last show discussing Peyton Manning and what he needed to do or not do in order for the Broncos to beat the Patriots. So this time we're going to focus on three of his teammates and why they're the key to getting the legendary QB another ring. Steve, fill in the blank. The Broncos will win if this player steps up or has a big game. They will win if Emmanuel Sanders has a great game. He's Denver's number one receiver and I believe uh, that Josh Norman will most likely be the guy who has to cover him. They can't have a game where they drop 10 passes as they did to Peyton Manning <laughs> a few weeks ago, and he has to be as good as he normally is, so I think he's a huge key to what Denver does. Well, Steve, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to disagree with you a little bit. Okay. Okay. Sanders is going to be important, but I think his running mate, Demarius Thomas, who I think Norman will be spending bulk of the game lined up on, will Maybe. be the... Uh, <laughs> the reason. He's the guy who has to step up. Demarius Thomas has been MIA. If you want to be a true yeah. number one receiver in the NFL, you can't disappear when your team is on the biggest stage, such as the NFL playoffs. So far, Thomas has not been a factor. Six catches, only 52 yards, less than nine a catch, no TDs. In the Broncos, wins over the Steelers and Patriots. 105 catches on seven, 177 targets regular season. Second highest totals of his career, but his 1,304 yards, 12 average, and six TDs were the lowest in the last four years. Career high, 18 drops, and he disappeared for long stretches of times. Now, most of that was due to the change in the Broncos' offensive yep. style and the inconsistent play at quarterback. He only had one touchdown catch yeah. in the 11 games he played with Peyton Manning. Mm. But number 88 needs to find his A game and be the playmaker we are all used to seeing. Yep. We know he's capable. After all, the last time the Broncos were in the Super Bowl and that blowout loss to the Seahawks, yep. he had 13 catches for 118 yards and a touchdown. Mm. He's got to put something close enough that if he Peyton does. wants another ring. It's true. Now, you guys both picked offensive players. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. In my mind, it wasn't the offense at all that won the game against the Patriots. It was the defense yes, and Wade yes. Phillips and being a masterful architect Hell of that 3-4 and holding the Patriots to 18 points. Hmm. That defense held up till about the last eight minutes of the game when Tom Brady showed how incredible he mm -hmm. is in yes, engineering scoring drive after scoring drive to put, give themselves a position to win that game. Leading that defense is Von Miller. You have on the inside Derek Wolf and Malik Jackson. Mm -hmm. They're filling up the gaps, stopping the run. On the outside is Von Miller everywhere in the field, mm -hmm. making yes. interceptions, getting a jump start on rushing the quarterback, making the quarterback throw a lot quicker. He's going to do that to Cam Newton, and he's also complimented by DeMarcus, DeMarcus Ware. Ware. That one-two punch is going to be the difference if the Denver Broncos win this game. Can't mm. argue with you. It's yeah. true. We also spent a lot of the last show talking about the likely NFL MVP, Panthers QB Cam Newton. As crucial as he is to Carolina's success, our guys are going to take a look at three of his teammates who may be just as crucial to getting Cam his first ring. Steve, fill in the blank again. The Panthers will win if this player steps up or has a big game. I think Greg Olson is the guy that has to have the big game for Carolina. And we all know what a great tight end this guy is. He's oh, one of yeah. the best in the game. From the U? Yeah. You hear about <laughs> Gronkowski all the time, but this guy is right up there with him. And... If he can find a way to break through on Denver's defense, that'll be interesting. I'm wondering who's going to cover him, whether that will be a keep to lead, possibly, because mm. he, the height, possibly. I see T.J. Ward. Maybe. Oh, no, sorry. That's Yeah, T.J. Ward is more likely the guy who's going to be on him, I think. Yeah. So you got a strong safety against a tight end matchup, which is a classic matchup. Yeah, and he's amazing once he makes the catches. Well, you know what? 
I'm going defense. I'll be the lone guy taking defense for the Carolina <laughs> Panthers. And you know what? First there was Revis Island. Then there was shut down Sherman. But these days, I think we can all agree the best shutdown cornerback in the NFL just may be shot Josh Norman. And now he's going to have a chance to show the world what NFL quarterbacks and number one wide receivers already know. You look at this guy, completed... Quarterbacks targeted him 105 times. They only completed 55 passes. Mm. They had a 54 passer rating against him, which is the lowest against any cornerback in the NFL this year. He Listen to these names. He held the likes of DeAndre Hopkins, Mike Evans, T.Y. Hilton, Des Bryant, and Julio Jones, all of whom have been to Pro Bowls, yeah. to a combined nine catches for only 89 yards. Mm. Okay? And... The infamous game against the Giants held Odell yeah. Beckham to zero catches in the first 39 minutes of that Week 15 yep. matchup. He had four tackles and a sack against Seattle in the divisional playoffs, and he made Larry Fitzgerald, who is going to be a first bout Hall of Famer, yes, he will. pretty much disappear in the game against Arizona. Four catches, 30 yards. Mm. Now, he, I think, he, I, I, like I said in the previous, mm -hmm. I, I disagree with you, Steve. I think he's probably going to spend most of the Super Bowl matched up against Demarius Thomas. Mm -hmm. And the way I look at it is this. Whether it's Thomas or it's Sanders or Sanders if he can shut one of those guys down whichever one he's assigned to Peyton Manning will have one less side of the field and one less playmaker he can go to and that's going to be huge for Carolina that certainly will be well I am going defense to Jay because who is the what is the most important defensive position in the game some it say is, cornerback, well, but I know where you're going with this. It you're is going the pass defender rusher. of the quarterback, Jay. Oh, oh I see where you're going. You so didn't what mean do you defense, have, you meant defense attorney. What do you have <laughs> yes. to do to get some attention for this significant position? You have to have a Hollywood movie made of you. <laughs> Be the only one in the NFL to have that happen. Have Sandra Bullock win an Academy Award. Michael Orr is guarding Cam Newton's blind side. Mm -hmm. He yes. was the difference, and it's very... Under it is a lot of there's not enough attention on this. He is a difference in transforming that offensive line from mm -hmm. last year. Mm -hmm. He came off a very at least people who analyze this stuff said he had a very bad season in Tennessee and he was cut. I don't think that was all his fault because no, you're only as good no. as the people around yeah, you. That's right. Nevertheless, four year contract they cut him after one year. Mm. Cam Newton reached out to Michael Orr and said, We need you on this team. He signed up for a two-year contract, and he had the season of a lifetime this year. Only three penalties against him all year mm -hmm. for wow. 25 yards, and he played 98% of all snaps. Mm. Look at that in terms of durability. Yeah. Who else yeah. has that? No one. His contribution to this to this team is really underanalyzed and underappreciated. He is going to be the difference in this game in terms of... Who's he going up against? Who does he have to battle all day long? Oh, he's going to have to yeah. battle the guys that I mentioned before. Probably um, be Von Miller. Uh, yeah, well, Von Miller. Most likely. I think Bond Miller would be coming from the outside, more or less. But well, it's, because, it, depending on uh, you know, depending well, on whether it's either going to be Miller or it's going to be Demarcus well, Ware. DeMarcus either Square. way, he could have a long no, day. I mean, yes, in terms could. of uh, like um, schedule plays, I think you know they're going to try to open up that lane for like four and five yards run with Cam Newton or behind their um, first and second line running back and to get those to slow the game down. We'll so see. yeah, that's yeah, maybe that's we'll what see. he's going to have to just push out the defensive tackles a little bit. We'll all, all I know is Carolina's just been so dominant throughout the playoffs that they have Denver's going to have a big challenge. Mm -hmm. That's, all, that's yeah. all I'm going to say. Denver is the best defense they'll see. Yes, they I are. know, but still. Mm -hmm. But they were dominant. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the biggest storylines of the playoffs is whether or not this is Peyton Manning's final go-round. The future Hall of Famer has danced around it, even going so far as to tell Patriots head coach Bill Belichick that, quote, this might be my last rodeo. <laughs> what will Peyton's legacy be after the game if it is indeed his last? Sean, start us off. I think that this is a tremendous game in terms of what Peyton Manning's legacy could be. I have been very hard on Peyton Manning through the years of never winning the big one, and I even feel bad about that because whenever I see him, he is so tremendously kind and gracious, and he's an mm -hmm. excellent, yes. like, representative of the entire league. He is, he is. But to me, it's a big difference in terms of when your one Super Bowl win comes against one of the worst teams ever to make the Super Bowl <laughs> in the Bears. And you Stop look at Bears. it, you look at it against the other multiple Super Super Bowl winners at this time that he's behind right now. Mm -hmm. His brother Eli Manning with two, Ben Roethlisberger with two. 
Um, Tom Brady as well four. with mm-hmm. with four. Yeah. He really needs this one to sort of get within the range of these other individuals who have excelled in areas where he not. That is what mm-hmm. truly leads to greatness. Super Bowl wins, not just beating the Bears in that rainy game in Miami. <laughs> Steve, what do you think? <laughs> well, I, I think that Peyton Manning is the best regular season quarterback maybe mm-hmm. that we've ever seen. I know in the postseason that's another story. 13 and 13 in the postseason. I get that. But I've never seen any quarterback as smart and intelligent and quick with his decisions and really figures out the game better than anybody I've ever seen, including Tom Brady. Yeah, it would be nice if if he wins a Super Bowl, and granted, the defense will probably have to do a lot of the work for him, but I think it's time for him to get another one, and I hope it happens for him. Well, the way I look at it this way, guys. I mean, I, I see definite you know corollaries between where Manning is in his career now um, and where Elway was at the same yeah. point, both being on Bronco, the Broncos, both you know not what they used to right. be, depending on other parts of the team to do that. But mm-hmm. I'm not one of those guys who believes that this is a big difference to me between one ring and two. I hear what you're saying, Sean. I just don't agree. To me, that is not really going to taint the legacy no. of a guy who is a sure fire first ballot Hall. I agree favorite. with that. Okay? Totally. I agree with you on his record. Yeah, yep. there's only one and two in Super Bowls. But look at this way, guys. Jim Kelly was 0 and 4. Fran Tarkenton was 0 and 3. Dan Marino is 0-1. Yep. All three of those guys are in Canton. That's right. Five-time MVP, 14 Pro Bowl, seven-time first-team All-Pro, number one all-time in passing TDs and yards, most game-winning drives, top five in half a dozen other categories all-time. Yep. He is going to be a, mentioned among the best to ever play the position. Yep. That list, that conversation forever for the rest of his life. So I don't think it matters what happens. What happens in Super Bowl 50, if he wins, to me, that's just gravy. Yep. It matters to him, though. Oh, without a <laughs> doubt. It does matter to him. Without it a doubt. It matters to him, though, yeah. <laughs> Well, guys, it is prediction time. Who do you have taking home the Lombardi Trophy from the 50th edition of the big game? What will be the score, and who walks away with the MVP award? Sean, let's start. My gut reaction in this game was Carolina Panthers are going to win it behind an incredible quarterback and rising star Cam Newton. I think it'll be about, ooh, 39 to... Let's say 31. Steve Rabinowitz also thinks about 35-21. Who's your, who's your MVP? There. Cam Newton. All right. Wow. Well, I may be the only one who will take Denver, and it took me a lot to decide on this. But knowing that this may be Peyton Manning's last game, I have to go with Denver. And Denver's defense impressed me so much yeah. that I think they have a shot to do it. I think it's a close game. I think Denver will win 27-24. The MVP is not going to be Paint Manning. It's going to be a defensive player. And I think it might be a guy, Akib Talib. Hmm. Could be. That's a nice pick. You know what? My heart is leading my head tonight, guys. I know that okay. normally doesn't happen on no. this show. I try to be as cold and dispassionate and analytical as I possibly can. I have been a Peyton Manning fan the entire time he's been in the league. So I am taking the Hollywood script ending (laughs) tonight. The Broncos defense, which, as I said, is I think is going to be the toughest one that Cam Newton sees all year. I think they will hold him and the Panthers somewhat in check, if it's possible to hold in check an offense that scored 500 points. I think we will get one more game of Peyton of the you know Peyton Manning of old yes, instead so of an I. old Peyton Manning. Yeah, exactly. I think he's going to lead the team on one more fourth quarter yep. drive to get his second ring. Broncos 24-21, and that drive gets Manning the game MVP. All right. There you go. Well, I'm, I'm rooting for Denver, <laughs> but I got to go with Carolina. I got to use my head this time, and I just they've just been so dominant. But I think it will be close. I'm going 32-30. to 30. We're split. Carolina, Ooh. and, yep, and uh, <laughs> Cam Newton has got to be MVP. Um, just a quick thing. Did any of us have either of these teams going to the Super Bowl? I didn't have Carolina. No. I'll tell you about it. I, I had, had the Patriots. One of them. No. I don't think so. No. no. So, <laughs> go figure. That's exactly. That's why they play the games. Exactly. That's right. Well, in honor of the 50th anniversary, we're going to take a trip down memory lane. Each of us is going to share our favorite Super Bowl memory from the last 49 editions. Steve, Steve, start us off. What's your favorite memory? You know, my favorite memory is actually what John Elway did. Hmm. And and when he got his, his ring, finally, and I remember the touchdown where he barreled into the end zone. I believe it was mm-hmm. 98 that happened mm-hmm. against the Green Bay Packers. And that, by the way, was one of the best Super Bowls I've ever seen, Favre against Elway. But the way it ended with Elway walking off into the sunset with that ring, you can't forget that. That was an incredible mm-hmm. way to go out. 
Well, my favorite Super Bowl memory was when Cher left the field in a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> I also love when Chubby Checker danced with the Rockettes. But I think my favorite Super Bowl memory was when Prince played the Randy's halftime. So we now we know what your favorite one. halftime show yeah, memories yeah, yeah. are. What's your favorite on the field yeah, memory? Exactly. Well, teams. you know, that's a tough one. There are a lot of great ones. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my first Super Bowl memories was being in school and everybody telling me that Dan Marino lost against the Redskins and the game was fixed, and I believe that till this day. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, no, no. One of the ones I remember watching was um, Boomer Siason's only Super Bowl. I wish yeah. he would have won that looking back. Joe so Montana pulled it out at the end. But the one that just, you know, in terms of memorable Super Bowls, a lot of it has to do with the people you're around. So mm -hmm. I remember being around a big family group and watching Super Bowl 21 with the Giants mm -hmm. against the Bills. No, I think that was not 21. I think 21 uh, was the first one. I'm not 25. Sure. 25. 25. Giants against the Bills. Mm -hmm. And this was when Scott Norwood lined up at the end of the game to kick a relatively short field goal. How many yards was it? 47. 40, no, it was yeah. shorter than that. Yeah, it was. 47. I thought it was like 39 or something. Yeah, it was 47. Wow. Wide right. We'll have to check that. But, <laughs> but so seeing Marv Levy hold the hand of the people around him, looking back, I mean, I'm such a Giant fan, but I almost wish that would have went through. But Buffalo had three more times to win, and they didn't even come close. And having Jeff Hoslett to take over for Phil Sims and phenomenal you know, bring the Giants to like their second Super Bowl under mm -hmm. Bill Parcells was my most memorable Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure you guys are not surprised I'm going with the Steelers Super Bowl. I mean, <laughs> the, the Steelers, I grew up watching the Steelers in the 70s, so that kind of sticks out for me. And for me... It's Steelers Cowboys Part Due, which is mm. Super Bowl 13. This was the first ever Super Bowl rematch. Cowboys were defending Super Bowl champs, looking for revenge to their mm. loss to Pittsburgh in Super Bowl 10. And both teams were looking to become the first to win three Super Bowls. Steelers are up 21-17, largely due to the fact that, you know, Jackie Smith dropped a short touchdown pass mm. in the end zone late in the third quarter. Wow. Um, when his feet came out from under him. It's funny, that blunder is what people remember about him. He had a 16-year Hall of Fame yes, NFL career, but that's what tickets him. Steelers scored 14 points in 19 seconds in the fourth quarter. Wow. Franco Harris from a, on, a, on the run and Bradshaw's fourth touchdown pass of the game. They're up 35-17. Roger Staubach leads them to 14 unanswered points late in the game. He closes 35-31. Yeah. They can't recover the onside kick. Pittsburgh holds on to win. That Super Bowl to me had everything. Top two teams in the NFL, top two quarterbacks in Staubach and Bradshaw. They combined for seven touchdown passes in that game. Wow. Two of the best defenses. Future Hall of Famers galore. High scoring, back and forth game filled with highlight reel plays. High level drama. Had me on my, the edge of my seat the entire game. That to me is, is my favorite Super Bowl memory. Mm. Well, my favorite memory is Super Bowl 42. Yes. We had my second favorite team, the New York Giants, uh, <laughs> beating the Patriots, who were the mortal enemy of my first favorite team, the Miami mm -hmm. Dolphins. Oh, yeah. yep. So I felt like I got some justice there. Um, and it also, obviously, of course, as we all know, robbed the Pats of their quest for the perfect season. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes. While ensuring that my 72 Dolphins kept their <laughs> sole right. perfect season uh, <laughs> legacy intact. Right. So it was like, on all sides, I was very happy about this one. And what a game it was. Yeah. I mean, with that oh, David yes. Tyree circus catch and Eli Whoop. getting out of that the shirt. Incredible. Sack. I mean, mm -hmm. it was. Yes. That was arguably the best play of all Super Bowl time. I, I'm there with yeah. you on that. At least one, in yeah. the top three, but I mean, arguably the best. The Giants have seen. been in some yeah. great Super Bowls. Oh, yes. Three yeah. of them. Yeah. Yeah. Really but came that down one is them. like just robbing the Patriots, who were my hated team, was amazing. Yeah, probably the best Patriots team of them all, of yep. all the great yes. teams they had. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. was. Absolutely. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. But um, Jay alluded to it with his closing on the last show. But we're now going to dive into the NFL's latest attempt to have a team in the number two TV market in the country and the effect it'll have on possibly three cities. The Rams are returning to Los Angeles for the 2016 season, and the Chargers or Raiders might be right on their heels. Jay, what's your take on all this? Uh, here, here's what it comes down to for me, guys, okay? The NFL has been hankering to return to the City of Angels ever since the Rams traded the Hollywood sign for the St. Louis Arch. For Los Angeles, I don't think the feeling is mutual. <laughs> I've said it before, I will say it again, and because it's obvious to me that Roger Goodell and his fan and his pals aren't listening. Hey, Roger, the NFL, Los Angeles doesn't care about the NFL. It's a Dodgers town. It's a Lakers town, though that could change a little maybe when Kobe uh, retires. Yes, I think every now and then it's even a Kings town, okay? And well, when it comes to football, too. LA is a college town, okay? Though you've got mm. two of the most storied programs in Division One football yep. sharing the L.A. Coliseum. And even when the Rams were good when they were in L.A. the first time around, they took a backseat to both the Trojans and the Bruins, as you know as well as I do, That's Steve. Fair. Yeah, I you know, their That's last fair. season in 94, they averaged 
43,000 at the Coliseum. Jeez. That's pathetic, and it was an all-time low. I'll tell you how this is going to play out. Next year, you're going to see some decent attendance yes. because, you know, mm -hmm. year one, new team, new city. Oh, yeah. You know, honeymoon year. But I'll tell you this, if they continue to be bad to mediocre, they're, they're only going to get one more break, and that'll be when the new stadium opens because then you got the novelty year. Mm. Here's the thing. <laughs> is there any city in the country that is more, attuned, uh, is more inclined towards fan apathy than in L.A.? I don't think it's going to work. Interesting. I agree with a lot of that <laughs> assessment. It's true. There's going to be a really rush. Oh, football's back for a year or two or if they're in the playoffs. But over the they long run, playoffs, LA is going to be a great football town. What about the Raiders, but though? Oakland, that is a working class city like Pittsburgh is. They, yeah. yes. Those people deserve a football team. And that's also a city of renowned social protest and even contributed to the rise of biker gangs. <laughs> what true. team more belongs in a city like that than the Oakland Raiders? Raiders. <laughs> That's where they belong. Yep. They should not be moved. There's something wrong when certain teams move. It's like the world will not be right unless the Dodgers move back to Brooklyn. The world is wrong when the Raiders move out of Oakland. Amen. And for me, I don't want to see the Chargers out of San Diego. L.A. doesn't want them. <laughs> well, no, they don't want them, and San Diego does. And I've been to San Diego, and I love that city. I mean, it is one of the nicer cities in the country. They were, they've been there for 30 years. Their team's been in the playoffs most of the time. They, the fans come out and support that team. Mm. They don't need to move anywhere. What they need to do is build them a new stadium so they can have those San Diego Chargers theme songs sung every yeah. time they're out there because they deserve to stay there. Yeah, What's they've you? got a great fan base, the oh, Chargers. Yeah. So I don't, I, the same with Oakland. Like, I feel both of them should stay where they are. Powder the, Blues the, 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 and San yeah. Diego. Thing, you need thing thing and LA song. doesn't need more than one team. No. I mean, come on. <laughs> the, only <laughs> reason, right. the only reason Stan Kroenke and how about that Missouri guy stabbing his home state oh, in the yeah. back mm -hmm. by taking the Rams away from St. Louis? Here's the <laughs> yeah. thing. Okay, he only wants somebody to come play in the stadium with him so he can recoup the money he's shelling out of his own pocket to build that stadium. I'm sorry, Dean Spanos is the only one who wants the Chargers to leave San Diego. Yeah, and the NFL should stop aiding and abetting him. I in agree. It. It's true. Like, I don't even understand why this is the way that things go down. I mean, the, yeah. as I said in my closing on the last show, this is what these owners do they blackmail the cities they're in until they get the stadium deal they want. They either threaten to leave till they get it, or they simply just pack up and leave. You it. Heard I the am St. sorry. Louis Blues fans, they said Kroenke sucks when when they were talking about getting that team out of there. They hate the idea of the of the Rams leaving, and the yeah, Rams are getting better. I mean, look, there's a reason yeah. the Raiders came back to Oakland. Why? Yep. Because it didn't work in L.A. No, Why? Because L.A. doesn't care about NFL football. It's a glamour city. It, yeah. The pirate does not belong I mean, belong they'll be like Fairweather fans. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's it. Exactly. That's not going to get you what you want. Exactly. Well, that music means it's time for the three-minute warning. Sean, lead us off. Calvin Johnson has announced his retirement at the age of 30. He has made millions, but he is leaving a huge pile of money on the table. Is that wise? Mm. As rare as people in Johnson's economic bracket are, those individuals are virtually unanimous with one belief. When millionaires are sick, injured, or in constant pain, they would trade it all just to be like us right here, in good health and able to enjoy life's simple pleasures. Retiring right now gives Calvin Johnson the best chance to enjoy a full and productive life. Two players come to mind that Calvin can compare himself to. Barry Sanders, who went off into the mm -hmm. sunset, and the truly magnificent Jim Brown. After nine years of dominating the NFL, he went to Hollywood. <laughs> Each left the game right around the same age. While they could have been dominant parts of their teams for years. But what they avoided is the violence of a game whose negative effects are coming to light more and more each day. With all this considered, I applaud Megatron for making a smart decision. Justin Tuck, a real giant in the NFL. When I think of great NFL players, I look at some important factors. Talent, aptitude, confidence, perseverance, will to win, and a fighting spirit. To me, Tuck personified all of these attributes. Out of Notre Dame, Tuck became part of an incredible defensive line that included he, Michael Strahan, and O.C. Umanura. As Giants, they scared the daylights out of many <laughs> yes, quarterbacks. They did. Tuck was as relentless as anyone, sacking quarterbacks with tremendous ferocity. He went on to finish his career with the Raiders for two years. While he was no longer the beast on the defensive line he had been, he still helped the Raiders start getting close to being a playoff team again. 
Is he a Hall of Famer? Two championship rings, two Pro Bowls, 66 and a half sacks, 22 forced fumbles, three interceptions and a touchdown, and he's the only player to record multiple sacks in multiple hmm. Super Bowls. You decide. But for me, I say he should be. 11 years and many of them great. Wow, could the Giants ever use you now? Yes, they could. <laughs> Former player Ryan Clark was on ESPN's Mike and Mike the other week talking about Carolina Panthers quarterback Cam Newton and why it seems that mainstream NFL fans, take that however you'd like, have a hard time accepting the MVP favorite. Clark said it was more about Newton's cultural identity than his racial identity, that Russell Wilson was easier to relate to for the mainstream fan because, skin color aside, he acts, behaves, and comes off as having a similar cultural background as the quarterback's mainstream NFL fans most identify with, the Mannings, Brady, Rodgers, etc. While it may be relevant, it seems to me that the minute a commentator, black or white, even dances around race, the rest of what he or she says is forgotten or taken out of context such as race as opposed to racism or culture as opposed to race, and then it does become only about race. I get what Clark was saying. Cam does not follow the established quarterback template, and some people, because they can't relate to it, will have a hard time accepting him. That's just a truth, right or wrong. But Clark is correct that people shouldn't really care about his antics, his cultural background, or even his skin color. They should only care about whether he can play the position. And he can. It's sad that even now in 2016, too many people will listen to Clark's comments and only hear what they want to hear based on their own bias and thus miss the whole picture. Yeah, Cam Newton isn't your father's NFL quarterback. So what? It seems we have finally come to the sad final chapter of Johnny Manziel's Cleveland Browns football <laughs> career. <laughs> Maybe not his NFL career, but the Browns are moving on, and thank goodness. Yep. After the latest in a string of off-field incidents and alleged assault, Cleveland finally made the right call and will release Manziel in March when their salary cap space is freed up. This kid so obviously needs help. <laughs> a source close to him described his state of mind towards the end of the season as a train wreck. Mm -hmm. He was spotted in Cleveland bars doing shots alone. Mm. Wow. Maybe getting wow. fired from his first per professional gig is the wake-up call he needs after being coddled his whole life. Not to mention he has plenty of room for improvement as a quarterback. Mm -hmm. Maybe now he can take a step back from the spotlight and have a shot at getting his life and career together. That new Harvard alumni brain trust in the Browns front office had better start drafting some high character guys or they could end up getting David Bladded out of <laughs> <laughs> For Jay Kaplan, Steve Ferguson, and Sean Roman, I'm Nisa Petrilli. Thanks for spending part of your evening with us. We'll see you on February 18th for another edition of On the Sports Lines. Remember, if you want to see this show again or catch up on any of the ones you might have missed, check us out at youtube.com slash onthesportslines and check out our blog at onthesportslines.blogspot.com. Good night, everyone. Hey, everybody. Hey, everyone. Enjoy the Super Bowl. Happy yep. Super Bowl. Happy Super Bowl. Happy Super Bowl.